This is our seventh screencast of the Chemical Kinetics series. Maybe I should get some intro music for this. Uh, nah. Uh, we've moved on to a new topic now. So previously we discussed reaction rates, so now we're going to do the kinetic theory of gases. So make sure you do familiarise yourself with the aims and objectives for this section. Uh, there is an intro video covering where we're going to go and what we're covering in this section. Uh, so do familiarise yourself with that before moving on, um, because this is going to be a little bit of a departure from just measuring rates. And what we're going to do is cover uh, kind of a little bit of a foundation before we move on to the kinetic theory of gases by looking at something called the Arrhenius equation. So this is something that relates the rate constant K to temperature. So previously I said the rate constant is constant. Now we're going to say that the rate constant varies with temperature. So what is constant between all the reactions of the rate? Constant is in fact constant. Um, it's in fact something called activation energy. It is the barrier that a uh, molecule must hop in order to proceed and react. So that'll be a little bit of revision for you. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick set of examples and ranges of activation energies as well, just as a check, just so you can recognize them. Uh, and then we're going to be able to calculate them graphically. So straightforward, if you can manage those kinetic equations and graphs, you can definitely manage that bit. So let's move on. Uh, Svante Arrhenius, a real big hitter as far as chemistry is concerned from the late 19th century and early 21st century. You can actually see him appear in the 1922 Solvay conference uh, picture, um, that famous one with all the key scientists from the day uh, there. Uh, and so he's got quite a track record of doing some really important stuff. Uh, he's founded quite a little bit of acid base theory. So, you know, a lot of we know about acids come from this. Um, and then ionic dissociation. He kind of proposed that salts will um, break up into ions, you know, sodium chloride going to things like sodium plus and Cl minus. That, that's him. And then greenhouse effects. So he did some of the first measurements that demonstrated the heat capacity and the ability to warm the atmosphere of things like CO2 and water vapour. Uh, so you can thank him for a few things, but mostly we're interested in the equation that bears his name, uh, this one. Uh, I'll not so much go too much into the theoretical justification for why this works. That's kind of the subject of this entire section. Uh, but I will go through all the labels in here. So K is obviously in this case the rate constant. Uh, we've done rate constants to death in the last set of lectures. Now we're going to apply it in a new way. And then there's the pre-exponential factor, this capital A that we stick here. Uh, this at the moment, as far as you're concerned, is just a factor that converts this neat little bit of theory here to the rate constant. It's just kind of a fudge factor, which is what I say in physical chemistry a lot. I say that you know we're relating two values and then we just multiply one value by something to get it right. It does have physical significance, but its physical significance is really the subject of this section of the course. So we will fill that in as we go. Uh, then there's the activation energy. So the activation energy is the, well, it'll be a little bit of revision for you, but we will cover it shortly. Um, it is an energy barrier that molecules have to hop over. Then there is the gas constant. You should be kind of familiar with what that is. Uh, it pops up in thermodynamics a lot, it certainly pops up in kinetics a lot, and then temperature. So what we're looking at here is a relationship between the rate constant and temperature, and it very specifically follows this equation. Now that equation looks a little bit complicated for you. I think it's worth figuring out how to simplify things. So equations in physical chemistry and physics in particular uh, really do get quite convoluted and really long. So you need to be able to simplify these down. So for instance, you'll probably be interested in y equals function of x graphs. You probably can do that, no problem. You can certainly do y equals 2x plus 3 and so on. Uh, this is just saying that there is another function of x here. All I've done is I've replaced temperature with x, I've replaced k with y, so we've got a graph here. Uh, and how do we deal with this? How do we convert it to the general shape of the graph? Uh, we have to go through the equation and just kind of eliminate what's constant, uh, what isn't a variable. Uh, so a here, that's the pre-exponential factor, that's kind of a constant, it's not going to change. Uh, the activation energy, uh, again, 
characteristic of an individual reaction is I'm going to change. And the gas constant, as the name suggests, is constant. So we can actually ignore these. The interesting parts of the fact that temperature is in fact 1 over. Uh, there's a minus here. And it's an exponential function. So all those three things uh, can be brought down. And we can plot this. So if you have a graphical calculator, you don't want to be plotting that. That's going to be a pain in the ass for you to calculate. You just want to plot this. So if you run to, say, a graphical calculator or to Mole from Alpha, um, that's a really good um, site for plotting graphs, you will get a graph that looks a bit like this. It's a fairly straightforward kind of exponential curve. But the important thing is to note that it doesn't just run away with itself up to infinity. Um, so let's substitute that x and y for the real things again. This tells you that the rate constant goes up as temperature increases, but not forever. There is something of a limiting factor and you get less returns for your temperature increases as it goes on. Uh, so that is, if, you, if, if you're all right with reading big long equations like this, uh, this is going to seem really stupid, but I know a lot of people do look at maths notation and really struggle. Um, the trick is just to look at it and try to break it down to its component parts just like this cut out the stuff that's constant and just convert it to something that looks a bit friendlier for you. Uh, so let's just recap the Arrhenius equation. What does it do? Uh, it relates um, the rate constant k as a function of temperature. It's very straightforward. And it includes the gas constant as a constant from physics and physical chemistry. It includes the activation energy, which we're going to cover soon. And it has a pre-exponential factor, which is effectively the subject of this entire section of the lecture course. So let's move on to activation energy. You should be used to seeing diagrams like this. Um, you start with the reactants on one side and you move to the products. And up on the y-axis, you have energy. So increasing energy goes up. Uh, so to react from iodine and hydrogen to form hydrogen iodide, it has to go up over this hill here. This is an, kind of a energy diagram and it has to get up that high in energy. Uh, now things like the reaction coordinate you might be used to be as being said to be kind of abstract um, but you can think of them as having real properties that reaction coordinate that x axis for instance imagine two atoms are stuck together and they start to stretch apart that distance is the x-axis so you can imagine the energy increases 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 and then they've broken and the energy decreases again. So as you plot the energy along the bond length, um, you see an activation energy appear. So these activation energies are measured relative to kind of their starting materials, so they can work in two different directions. This delta uh, E here or EA or here EA refer to two different directions. So this is if we are going backwards in the reaction and this is if we're going forwards in the reaction. Now this says that our rate constants are going to be different in each, each case. So the Arrhenius equation relates the rate constant based on the activation energy. So for a set temperature, we know this forward reaction is going to go faster than this backwards reaction. Uh, but of course, the actual rate is proportional to concentration, remember. So as the reaction proceeds forward, the actual, we reduce the concentration of reactants, so the rate slows down. But we increase the proportion of products. So the rate of the backwards reaction increases and eventually they meet each other and hence why we have equilibria. So this we'll discuss a little bit more when we do the relationship to thermodynamics but for now you can kind of tell that because the activation and energy areas are different in each direction we get different kind of rate constants in each direction but because of their proportion the rate's proportionality to concentration they will eventually kind of meet up and equilibrate. Uh, now, the activation energy, we can have a look at it in another way about how the molecules cross it. Uh, so this is sort of a something of a distribution function. If we have a number of molecules in this energy and a number of molecules with that energy, uh, their relationship is here. Um, this is not quite the same as, well, we, we can think of it as the same as quantization of energy from quantum mechanics, or we can just treat it as just an arbitrary set of energies. Imagine that's molecules that are moving at 
200 meters per second. These are molecules that are running at 400 meters per second, uh, all that kind of speed. Uh, what's the energy difference between those two molecules doing that? What's their difference? And then we put it into this distribution and we can find that out. So if we do a little bit with that equation and give it more of a kind of a plot as a distribution function instead, and we'll get onto this later, um, we can get different values uh, or different plots depending on different values of temperature. So here at low T, you can see there's a lot more molecules at kind of low energy because energy is on the x-axis here. Uh, higher temperature, it starts to move along. Higher temperature, again, we'll probably get something like this. Uh, so what you can see is that there are more molecules above this activation energy point. So this is just marking the value. It's got no real bearing on the equation at all. This is just marking the value where the activation energy should lie. So anything to the right of that line will react. Anything to the left of that line doesn't have the energy to, so it can't react. So you don't necessarily need to memorize this kind of distribution equation. It is useful to be familiar with it and understand where it comes from and what it's doing. Uh, so it's just some examples of activation energy. So if I tell you to calculate an activation energy bar uh, barrier and you come up with half a million kilojoules per mole, you should be aware that that's wrong. That's way too high. Uh, the typical values are between 10 and about a couple of hundred kilojoules per mole. This is the chemical range we are dealing with. Anything higher than that, and you're talking things like nuclear chemistry, so it's clearly not. And if you've got huge negative numbers, like minus 10,000, Clearly something's wrong. So this sort of number range is what we're after. So these are examples of activation energy. So obviously these are some, some of them are higher than others, so they're going to go slower than the, uh, the ones with lower energies. And there are some kind of weird effects involved. So this is not a typo, that is actual negative activation energy. And I'll just bring this up because it's evidence of a more complicated reaction scheme going on. And we will cover that towards the end of the lecture course. All you need to know for now is if you do see an activation energy with a negative value, it just means something more complicated is going on. It doesn't mean that uh, that activation energy graph has reversed and that we're doing this. Okay, with that is now the activation energy barrier. And that's the reaction coordinate. Uh, it doesn't mean that. Otherwise, you know, the if they would just go down to the lowest energy and be, you know, sink into a transition state. It's, that makes no sense. It's just evidence that something more complicated involving the forwards and backwards reactions and some equilibria are going on. Uh, and it's kind of an edge case where our kind of intuitive understanding of what's going on kind of falls down a little bit. Uh, so let's just recap activation energy. It is the energy required for a reaction to progress. Um, and it is defined as the energy difference between the reaction and its transition state. So it is that energy there, or because it can go in both directions, forward and backwards, it's that energy. So we can have two different values and they, uh, they contribute to where an equilibrium would lie. Now, how do we determine it? I won't insult your intelligence by doing this too slowly. If you were comfortable determining the rates graphically from the previous section, you should be more than capable of doing this. So the Arrhenius equation is an exponential form. Physical chemists don't like that. We hate things that are exponents. Sure, you can do the least squares regression thing with um, an exponential decay factor and solve it using solver, but well, let's do it the simpler way and we'll just linearize it. So you take a logarithm of both sides of that, uh, and you get this equation on the right. Now I have mashed that up a little bit, and um, that's not usually how you would see it written down in a textbook. The reason I've rearranged it a bit like this is to emphasize the following. That is y equals m x plus c. It is a straight line. In fact, there's a straight line, but it does shot ahead um, a bit too quickly. So what we're interested in is we have different temperatures that we've recorded a reaction at. Uh, we have a rate constant that has been def determined at each of those temperatures. I think when I'm scribbling left and right, it's um, PowerPoint is taking that as me wanting to 
move or something, uh, which is a bit weird. But we can't plot, anyway, we can't plot temperature versus just rate constant here. That doesn't give us anything useful. But we can get one over temperature, temperature to the minus one, and we can get log k. So if we plot those, it really is jumping today, isn't it? Um, if we plot those, we get our different values out that we can then actually go ahead and plot on a straight line. So this is our straight line graph. As you can see, we've plotted that y equals mx plus c version. I was reiterated here. It's always useful to write this kind of thing down so you can see it. And here we also have a layer y equals mx plus c. Uh, so we can figure out the value of m, the gradient. So that m is equal to minus activation energy via r. Then to get the activation energy out, we just simply take r to the other side, take the minus to the other side, and we get that is equal to minus to the gradient times r, which we can calculate here. We take it, that gradient multiplied by the gas constant and work it out into kilojoules per mole. It's really straightforward. We can also, if we get rid of the log and do it e to the power of something, we get the pre-exponential factor out as well. So the reasonable range for pre-exponential factors is quite literally in the millions. Uh, reasonable ranges for activation energies are in a couple of kilojoules per mole to a couple of hundred, depending on what the reaction is. And as you progress as a chemist, you probably get an instinctive understanding of what things should have a high activation energy and what shouldn't. Um, really simple reactions uh, will have a low activation energy. They will go ahead quite easily. Um, so let's just review this entire section now. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time on it compared to what I was planning. Uh, we did the Arrhenius equation. So that is relating K, the rate constant, to a pre-exponential factor times e to the power of the minus activation energy over rt so it is a function of temperature to get you a rate constant the activation energy ea that is the energy required for molecular rearrangement uh, and that remember goes in both directions so a reactant can form a product or well, the product can actually come back to a reactant remember the inverse doesn't care that we call them reactants and products they are just two chemical entities and they will jump back and forward between each other kind of at will but at least obeying these equations and only a certain proportion of molecules will have the energy to hop over that barrier so determining the activation energy well we linearize the um the Arrhenius equation we take logs of both side of it then we find that our variables become log k and one over t and if we plot them together we get a straight line so if we've taken four or five experiments, we can plot them to a best fit line and get the gradient of it. And that gets us our activation energy. So that kind of covers the basics of what we want to do. Uh, later on in the lecture, we'll probably be solving these as problems and going into a little bit more detail about um, maybe some errors, maybe. Uh, but until then, Hope this was useful. Hope it wasn't too much revision. Uh, do try and remember all the equations as well, uh, especially the Arrhenius equation. You don't want to forget that at any point or think that it's the wrong thing. Um, so see you soon at the lecture.